brain for me. Thank you. Virtual housekeeping. We've got people logging on. We have you on mute. Just stay on mute until um, we ask for questions or ask you to unmute just so that everybody gets to hear our amazing presenters. You will have a time um, throughout the presentation. You can submit questions. Uh, Amy Villasenor will be managing the chat box. And then also we welcome towards the end of uh, come off mute and talk directly with the presenters. So when it gets closer to the end, um, Amy will put a link in the chat. That's our feedback and attendance tracking survey. That information gets shared with high schools so if you, or in middle schools. If you are a Puck student, fill out that survey. It's super short, get your voice heard, and also get credit for being here. I want to welcome our awesome expert panel. Um, I don't know if Dr. Anderson is here. I don't believe so. Okay, so hopefully he can join us um, at some point, but we do have Miss Samantha, it's Calvillo, correct? Excellent, Samantha Calvillo. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, she is a clinical social worker at UCLA Health. We've got Miss Generous Genesis, Morales, who is generous with her time for being here, a licensed marriage and family therapist with Bloom Within Therapy, which I love the name of, of that organization. And also, um, Ms. Morales is a Puck alum. So we're super excited that she is Puck alum with us today. And then we've got Dr. Christine Saratagouda, Puck School's Director of Clinical Services. Thank you all for joining us. I just want to point out students, us, like all of you who had work school life, they had all of that today too, and still decided to give back and uh, be here to share their stories with you and expertise. So thank you panel for being here. Uh, why we do this career combo, I just wanna remind everybody, career knowledge. You can't get enough of it. As you students, if you are in sixth grade, if you are in 12th grade, if you are a parent, if you are Puck alumni joining us today, to get this time from experts, real world experience is invaluable. Your school counselor, teachers, no one has the insight that they do, and they're going to be able to answer your questions today and really give you, uh, keep you in the know on, on things that you're interested in about or just inform you on things you maybe you didn't even think about before. We want you to be empowered to make informed decisions regarding your future. So glad that you invested time to join us today. I'm going to start out here and just ask um, all of you, you know, whether you're in sixth grade, twelfth grade, whether you're one of our career experts, to have that looming question of what am I gonna be when I grow up? Or what, how do you figure that stuff out? You guys have real jobs. How did you figure out your story? So what key experiences helped you figure out what you wanted to be and also landed you in the position you're at today? I'm gonna start off with, if you don't mind, Ms. Cavillo, uh, would you please tell us about just key items in your life that got you to where you are today? Sure. So I think I always had a kind of common thought process of I want to help people, you know, and I just went through a lot of different ways of how I wanted to do that. You know, I went to a high school that unfortunately didn't have really solid guidance when it came to counseling. We we're really understaffed. I'm from like a very small rural town in Central California. We didn't have the support. No one in my family had gone to college. Um, you know, but I just said, I want to help people. And I started off slowly just taking my general ed classes. I went to a community college. I was like, if I don't really know what I want to do, I might as well learn about everything and kind of let that guide me. Um, I took a few sociology courses while I was in community college and fell in love. I was like, I don't know where this is going to lead me, but it teaches me about people. It's awesome. Followed that. Um, decided maybe I want to do research to help communities of color and kind of like figure out how our society can improve in that sense. Um, got my bachelor's degree out in the Bay Area, took a social work class and I was like, oh my God, this is it. This is what I've been looking for and I didn't even know it. Um, so that led me to get my master's degree in social work and that's, you know, that's how I ended up working for UCLA um, as a social worker. I work in the ER and at the Rape Treatment Center. So just random little things, just kind of following my heart and just pushing forward, even if the goal didn't seem extremely clear all the time. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, next, may you please share your story, Ms. Morales? 
course. Um, so kind of like Ms. Calvillo was sharing about, you know, wanting to help people. And I feel like that's something always that was instilled in me too, and wanting to help others, you know, and especially wanting to give back to my community, especially as being in a, a Puck alum. I feel like that's one of the commitments, right? Giving back to the community. And I feel like that was something I always heard. And it was something that I always wanted to do. Um, and for me in high school, something that helped me decide to pursue psychology was um, I took a psychology 101 course when I was, I think, like my junior year in high school or sophomore year. And I was like, oh, my God, I love this. Like, this is so cool, how the mind works, people's behaviors. I really liked understanding that. And also in my junior year of high school, I had a, a, a MFT training, which is a marriage family therapist training, which is what Dr. Sartaguda, you know, trains the trainees. And so I had the experience of having therapy, you know, and the therapist really helped me understand how my thoughts and my feelings impact my behavior. And that to me at that age was mind blowing. I was like, I didn't even know that I could manage like my feelings, you know? And so understanding that was really helpful for me. And so I went to UC Santa Cruz and I majored in psychology. And after I majored in that, I didn't really know that I wanted to be a therapist. Um, I was kind of unsure of what to do with my major, but through working at Puck, um, I used to translate for family sessions uh, for the MFT trainees for the clinical program. And I thought it was so cool how the therapist helped, you know, a parent understand their child and help them communicate and help them learn skills. But I also saw the, the disconnection because of the language barrier, you know, and I thought about how, you know, in Latinx communities, you know, there aren't that many Latinx therapists. And I thought, well, this would be an awesome career for me to pursue so that I can give back to my community, help others and also help my community, you know, and help give back in that sense. And so I started asking all the MFT trainees what programs they were in and what they liked, what they didn't like. And then I applied for my master's in marriage family therapy. And I loved it and it's definitely been rewarding and been helpful for my own healing journey so I that's that's my little story <laughs> thank you so much I love hearing this um I love hearing the stories and I think this it really resonates with the the students hearing your why and how you your personal career journey so thank you ladies so much and Dr. Sarah Taguda would you please share your story Sure. Um, just if there's any confusion, I have two boxes on the screen because I had um, some problems with the internet. So now I'm going to use uh, my iPad so that at least you can see me as I talk since I think some of you might have pinned speaker view. So uh, when I was in high school, I think I just always knew that I wanted to be a therapist. And it was through just talking with my friends, my friends using me as being their confidant. And I just really enjoyed helping others. So I knew that when I went um, to college, I went to LMU um, and I got my bachelor's in psychology. And through taking the psychology classes, it just reinforced um, that belief in me that I knew this was the career path. I wanted to be a therapist. Um, but I didn't know what type of therapist or exactly what route I would take. Um, once I graduated, I knew I was going to go to graduate school, but I didn't know which one. It really helped my senior year. I was on the LMU campus and I saw a flyer for an art therapy workshop. And to me, I, I had no idea what art therapy was. And I wanted to check it out. It just sounded super cool. I went and I absolutely fell in love. They showed us how you could use art in the therapy with clients and how you ask them to, you know, draw and use clay and paint and, and just use different um, creative modalities and through your processing of feelings. And I knew that I wanted to take that path and it happened to be at LMU. So I graduated in um, from LMU in 93. And then I actually took a whole year taking college level art classes because I actually had all my psych prerequisites, but I didn't have the prerequisites for college level art classes. So I got to take a whole year of art classes. And then the following year, I got to enter into my um, graduate program, which was Meriton Family Therapy, specializing in art therapy. 
so that was a two year program. Um, when I graduated from my art therapy program, um, the first job I took was for glasses stood for gay and lesbian adolescent social services. That was absolutely amazing. It was there that I fell in love with working with adolescents, um, working with gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender adolescents. I learned so much about probation, DCFS, um, just so many different areas. And from that position, I started off as an entry level therapist. Then I moved uh, up to a program director and then I eventually became director of training. And through my position as a director of training, I realized that I not only loved working with teenagers, I really loved working with new therapists and training them on how to be a therapist. And so from there, um, I actually um, knew uh, Dr. Ref Rodriguez and, um, and I knew that he was starting um, some charter schools. And so I approached him and Dr. Elliot at the time and I proposed this idea of creating a training program here at Puck where I could train and supervise new therapists who are in graduate school and teach them how to work with elementary school kids, middle school kids, and high schoolers. And that was, I think, uh, about 20 years ago. And I've been here. Um, since then and um, have enjoyed my work. It started off with just me. And I think I had um, uh, 16, I had 16 interns at the time and there were only four puck schools. Now we have blossomed to 14 puck schools. I now have four clinical supervisors who work with me and I hire up to 64 counselors for not only our puck schools, but about 14 contract charter schools. So it's really grown. And I think that the work I do right now is just so amazing because I get to not only still service youth, but I also get to service um, newly uh, learning therapists who are really um, practicing for their field and for their profession. Thank you so much. Really interesting stories, all of you, and, and just hearing about your different um, populations that you serve. I'm super excited to even learn more. Uh, let's see, we are wanting to always paint the picture for our students with regards to real world experience. So many students think I want to be X, whatever, whatever their occupation is. But when it comes to the real day to day of what your world looks like, can you please paint a picture on average of what your world looks like in your position now? And depending on where you are, what would it look like for someone that just starts out if it's different than what your situation is right now. Um, I might just reverse the order this time just to keep it fresh. Would you mind kicking it off, Dr. Sarataguda? Sure. Um, so I I think I have to answer the question um, backwards um, and kind of talk about real world experience when you start and then in my current position. I would say that when I started my first jobs, my first job at Glass, the work is, and this is also kind of hearing from my current trainees who are in kind of entry level positions, the and work that you can, oh. Can I interrupt you and just, can you say what the exact position is? Like what the job title is, please? Sure, okay, so what I'm describing is someone who, let's say, majored in psychology, got a bachelor's in the psychology field, and then went on to get a job, uh, or went on to their master's. Actually, I can talk about bachelor's level uh, positions, because I am aware of that. Um, when you go in and get your bachelor's um, in psychology, the different types of jobs that you could do is, you know, child care, um, child, it's called child care worker, and it's working in group homes or uh, foster agencies working directly with youth. It's not going to be your typical kind of therapy sessions, um, but you're working with all different kinds of populations, um, dealing more with kind of behavioral issues. So I would say 
if you are going into psychology and you like the idea of being a therapist, working kind of one-on-one -on -one with people, it's the, one of the best routes you can take is to get your master's in marital and family therapy or social work or school counseling. Um, because obviously uh, I am a marital and family therapist, it's easiest for me to speak to that field. So moving on to getting your master's in marital and family therapy and then the job opportunities out there, most of them um, are kind of entry level positions where you're really dealing with, um, you know, clients in crises, you're doing a lot of on call work, um, you're considered a marital and family therapist associate. So that's your first position right after graduate school. And then basically, um, you're, like I said, in an entry level position, a lot of the jobs out there are through the Department of Mental Health. So you could get jobs working in outpatient clinics, hospitals, um, probation, DCFS, um, courts. Um, at the end of our program, we always do kind of a job search and we kind of go over the different types of jobs out there. And again, you're, um, you, you tend to have high caseloads, um, there's a high degree of burnout kind of in your first two years, and then eventually you get licensed. And then once you're licensed, you can go into private practice. Um, you can go to, into private practice before being licensed, but you'd have to be under the supervision of a licensed professional. And then once you're licensed, more doors open up for you. And then at your two year anniversary of being licensed, you can supervise. And really that's, um, where I'm at now is having been licensed, obviously many, many, many years past the two year anniversary. And really when you super, when you're a licensed marital family therapist and you can supervise, there are so, so, so many doors that open up to you. Um, for instance, like myself, I, I entered as an entry level therapist, then I became a program manager, then I became a director. So once you become licensed, you can then supervise, then the doors of, of more administrative work open up to you. And like for myself as director of clinical services here at Puck, what my job really entails now is overseeing the home mental health program. I oversee my clinical um, supervisors who are all licensed professionals. I oversee them and their direct work with the counselors who work at our PUC schools and our contract schools. I also um, have to do a lot of reports and meet um, with administration um, to talk about the progress of our mental health um, program. So again, uh, there's a series of steps before you can kind of get to an, an administrative position like myself, um, but it's all rewarding and it's all in service of clients. Thank you so much, um, Ms. Morales, thank you. So I can add a little bit to what Dr. Sartorudo was sharing, you know, because I've um, it's kind of a very similar route, um, but I can also share a little bit about, you know, when you're in the master's program too, how you do the MF, you're an MFT trainee while like in the last, because the program is normally two years. And so in the last year you do the MFT trainee and which is like the clinicians that work with Dr. Sarta Guda in that program for the clinical services. Um, and then once you are done with your hours, you know, that are required for graduation and all of the program, then you become an MFT associate. associate. And then from there, your goal is to uh, also collect hours. So, I mean, from when I was collecting my hours is about, I think, 3,000 hours that you have to collect. Um, that normally takes about two years. Um, and once you finish those hours and you submit all that paperwork to the BBS, which is the behavioral, oh my God, I don't remember what it stands for, but the BBS, um, they approve your hours and then you are allowed to start to um, schedule your exam, which is a licensing exam. Um, and when you pass that exam, then you're officially a licensed MFT. And like Dr. Sartorudo was sharing, you know, a lot of doors open up during that time um, as well. But to share a little bit about my experience working in DMH, which is the Department of Mental Health. Um, I worked in community mental health and I worked in Long Beach at 
this um, place called the Guidance Center and I worked intensive services. And so my caseload was, was pretty big. And during the time I was learning different EBPs, which are evidence-based practices. Um, and I was working with really intense cases that have to do with um, when they like the spectrum of like, you know, sexual abuse, human trafficking, physical abuse. Um, and so I learned so much. I learned so much from being, you know, in that position, but I also experienced a lot of burnout because of that, because a lot of the focus in community mental health is on productivity, um, which is more like the quantity of work than, uh, to me was more the quantity of work than the quality of work. So that was really, um, really heavy, but I feel that for me, what helped me through all of that was my supervisor and the people who I had helping me through, you know, in the program that I was in, which was intensive services, and that was really helpful. I think sup the supervisors that you have in the beginning really help set a foundation um, to the, exper the whole experience after that. So once I was licensed, I left that job and I went to work at Violence Intervention Program, which is in East LA. And then I was there for two years and I learned a lot there too, um, but also experienced burnout and realized that for me, something I wanted to do was a little bit different than what community mental health was asking of me. And so I decided to do private practice. And so now I have, you know, my private practice, which the name is Bloom Within Therapy. And I share an office with one of my colleagues. And right now my focus is on individual therapy and couples therapy. Um, and it's awesome. I really enjoy the work. I get to make my own schedule and I get to, you know, work on learning new things, reading new things, doing different workshops and just being able to give back. I hope when this pandemic is over and everything, you know, we can host more workshops in the community because I'm located by USC. Um, so hopefully, you know, do more workshops for the community and teaching different things when it comes to anxiety, depression, or even just, you know, grief and loss. I think grief and loss is such an important topic right now. Um, but yeah, that's, that's, I guess it's, hopefully that answers the question of that's what my schedule looks like now. Yeah, no, thank you so much. And, and it's here, it's great to hear the different avenues. Now I'd love to hear your, your uh, real world experience, your story, Ms. Cavillo. Hi, so very similar to the marriage and family therapy route, uh, the master's in social work is also two years. Um, you do a clinical internship, both your first and second year. So you're a trainee. So my first year I was a therapist at a forensic nonprofit in downtown LA. And my second year, um, I did my internship in the emergency room at UCLA Medical Center of Santa Monica, which is my full-time job now. Um, I also work at the Rape Treatment Center, which is on site in Santa Monica, but it's considered an outpatient clinic. So UCLA Health is like the large bubble of the healthcare system. Then you have the medical center itself, which is the hospital. Then you have little clinics. So at the rate treatment center, I do, um, I'm a therapist there, an on-call therapist. So whenever we have um, victims of sexual assault that are within the five day window to get an examination, I go in, if I'm on call, you're on call for 15 and a half hours, if you get a case at three in the morning, go in, meet them there within 20 minutes, kind of guide them through the process of filling out paperwork, navigating their interaction with law enforcement, letting them know about their options, their rights, um, accompanying them for the exam. Uh, so that's kind of like my side gig. I do that like twice a month. So for that position, um, UCLA does hire um, MSW, so social workers, licensed in marriage and family therapists, um, psychiatrists, psychologists, uh, PhD, PsyD. So anyone really with a master's except for school counselors, we don't hire. Um, the medical center itself, uh, so in the hospital, only hire social workers. So there in the ER, I was lucky enough to get hired um, where I interned. So I've been there for the past year and a half because I graduated in 2019. So there, my day typically looks like it's, um, it's intense. So you'll get there. We're in charge of doing all these psychiatric evaluations. So if we have someone that's brought in on a 5150, which is a psychiatric hold for people who are in a, a crisis with their mental health, 
Um, I evaluate them, determine what the appropriate treatment would be, work on getting them transferred out. Um, I also see a majority of our patients who, um, who are experiencing homelessness, get them connected with resources. Um, if we have people that are brought in as um, like John Doe's, so if we have someone that was in a serious accident and we can't identify them, I get involved, try to find next of kin, um, provide grief support for anyone who's lost a loved one there. Um, yeah, so it's, it's very intense. It's good for people who like to stay busy and who like the excitement of not knowing what comes next. So it's very different than, you know, a, a therapist where you're kind of scheduling your day. Um, but you can also do therapy in that way with your master's in social work. Most of the people I went to school with went that route and do work through the department of mental health. Um, but I think it's nice to see with these degrees, you do have a variety of options and you can always switch it up. Um, you know, I have some that went into teaching and, uh, there's lots of stuff you can do. So yeah, that's a little bit about what my role looks like. Excellent. It, it's really fascinating. Uh, students, please know mental health kind of seeps into every aspect of our lives and so many different pathways you can take. So many students, when they say I want to be X, it's because they know of one person in one field in one avenue, not realizing like a social work in ER, a social worker in school, a social worker in, you know, a, a lot of different areas or marriage, family therapists, clinical counselors, like there's so many different options. Um, but thank you so much for sharing your stories. Super, super interesting. And I, I know when I was a kid, I never really thought about the schedule, but then as you get older and you realize family and life and, and what you want, um, you can really pick a career and pick a, a field or an aspect of that career and find a schedule that meets you and your family's needs. So that's that's always really interesting in it in with regards to that. Um, when it comes to advice for a student that is thinking, hey, I, I, I might want to do what, what you guys are saying is kind of cool. I might want to go into counseling, whether it be social work, marriage, family, school counseling. What advice might you have, and, and Ms. Morales, I'm gonna ask you to kick this off and go first. What advice do you have for a kid who's in middle school or high school? Um, how would you recommend they, they kind of, what they can do now to learn more or set themselves apart from the rest? Um, that's a, that's a, a spot question. Um, I would say, you know, do research and ask questions to the people who are in the field, if you know anybody in the field. I think for me, something that was really helpful is was um, being able to ask um, the MFT trainees from the clinical program, you know, their experience and if they liked it, if they didn't like it, you know, and asking them about their programs. I think asking questions, being curious about you know, the work, you know, even this, like this here, being here, you know, and getting to know what the field is like. And if that is something for you, I think is so important um, as you make that decision for yourself. Thank you. I also want to piggyback on what you shared earlier. Um, Ms. Morales, you went to which puck school? I'm sorry. Oh yeah, I went to um, Cal's Middle School, which was first graduating class of Cal's Middle School. So that uh -huh. makes me <laughs> um, but also uh, Cal's high school. Okay, and you shared that um, for students that are in middle school and for students that are in high school, you, you probably know this already, but we have dual enrollment programs at all of our puck schools and Ms. Morales shared, she kind of get the, the counseling bug when she took a dual enrollment psychology class, correct? Yes, I did. So these, are, these are free college classes that as long as you're passing your core subjects at puck, um, and, and your good attendance and behavior, you have access to free college classes. And that's the perfect place to get a taste, earn college credit to save you money for later and get a taste of an occupation to figure out you love it or it's just as valuable to figure out like, hey, glad I took this class and glad I'm not picking that as my major. So mm -hmm. I think your, your example is perfect. And can I add on to what you're saying right now, too, is, um, you know, yeah, take advantage of the classes, you know, especially the intro classes, like intro to sociology, intro to psychology, right, intro to environmental science, sciences, or, you know, just the intro classes at during high school so that you can decide, you know, like, do I really like this? Do I not like this? 
but also just to build the, the credits that you have, right? Because when I went into um, college, UC Santa Cruz, um, by the end of my freshman year, I was already a soft, uh, I was like mid sophomore year because of the amount of credits I had. So that gave me access to classes that people didn't have access until like their junior year in college. And so that was really helpful too. And in having that access because of the classes that I took during high school too. Thank you so much for adding that. That's super, super helpful. Um, next we'll go with, how about back to you, Ms. Cavillo? Yeah, so I also really recommend taking some intro courses if you can. Um, I took intro to psychology when I was in high school, um, just out of like, oh, well, why not, you know, I have an extra class and it was super interesting and also got me more interested in, you know, human behavior and the biology related to our actions. And if you can do that, that'd be great. If you know someone who works in the field, I really recommend reaching out to them, sitting down and say, hey, what are the pros and cons of your job? What was the process in school like? Figure out if you can even shadow someone's shift. I know more places than you would think allow that to say like, hey, can I shadow a therapist, um, you know, while they're doing like their daily office? Obviously you can't sit with them with a client, but see what the paperwork looks like, see what the office environment is. Um, I know like UCLA Health allows volunteers to go in so you can totally shadow a social worker there for a day. Um, or another good option um, is if you make a LinkedIn account to just message people who work in companies or in roles that you're interested in, message them and say, hey, do you want to have like a Zoom session or can you just kind of tell me what a day in your life looks like? Um, and just explore a lot of avenues. I think if you meet someone who's a social worker and you love it, also reach out to other people like school counselors, MFTs, and realize there's a lot of different ways to do the same job. And it's not a one size fits all, so remain open-minded. Great advice, thank you so much. Dr. Sartaguda. Yes, okay. Um, so I, I think that Ms. Cavillo, Ms. Morales gave wonderful advice, um, talking to people, asking questions and for all of you Puck students, we have a clinical counseling program here at Puck. Um, you can request to speak to a counselor just to learn about what their job is like. You don't have to necessarily have an issue um, or be referred to counseling. You can, you know, shoot them an email. You can shoot me an email as a Puck employee um, asking me questions. I am happy to answer questions about the field all of my trainees who are working at every single pop school are happy to answer questions. I have four clinical supervisors, um, three of which are um, uh, MF LMFTs and one is a licensed clinical social worker. We are all happy um, to give you feedback. But I will say um, one thing that I wanted to add as a, um, a high schooler, uh, as a high schooler, some an opportunity that is available to you is teen line. My daughter actually applied and is currently a teen line volunteer. And so teen line are teens helping other teens on a crisis hotline. And I have to say, I've been amazed at the level of training. It was actually a 30 week long training program. It was like 65 hours. She learned so many of the same things my MFTs learned. She learned all about child abuse, um, suicidal ideation, um, lear learning about resources so that she can then be an operator on this teen line and listen to teens call in with all their different types of crisis situations and be able to provide them with support. So teen line, volunteer, it's a great opportunity, gives you great a great foot in the door Super amazing, I think, on your college app to be able to say that you were a teen line operator. They take volunteers as young as 14. So I think that's what sophomore or later years of freshman year. You can do it your whole, excuse me, the whole time you're in high school. So that's one that's um, a, a, a big uh, suggestion for anyone who's really serious about wanting to learn more about the field and, and just to see, do you like helping to support other people? Um, next is, I would suggest 
learning about the different types of careers. There are so many different careers. I mean, you've seen, you know, licensed marital and family therapist. You see clinical social worker, um, the two fields we have represented here. But in addition to that, there's LPCC, which is licensed professional clinical counselor. They also work um, with different populations providing mental health support, but they also focus on a career prep. Also something that you can go into is a school counseling uh, master's program where um, you get trained more on the education piece, but you are working at schools. And um, some of you who are in high school at a pop school, you have a college counselor there on site. You can ask them more about their route, their education. It's probably going to be a little different than Ms. Cavillo, Ms. Morales, and myself. Um, so school counseling is definitely a route. And other professions, psychologists, right? A lot of people hear the word psychologist and think that applies to all mental health professionals, and it's not. School psychologist or psychologists focus a lot on testing. So you can be a school psychologist and you'd be a psychologist in a school um, providing testing, a lot of IEP work um, with students at various school levels. You can be just a clinical psychologist and provide different types of testing and mental health support um, to various populations. So being a psychologist is different than being a marital family therapist or a social worker. And lastly is psychiatrists, which is more in the medical field. Those are um, individuals who are medical doctors who can prescribe medications. They uh, typically always work in hospitals and deal with more severe types of um, mental disorders. So there's so many different routes that someone can go into when you're interested in psychology. So take this time while you're in middle school or high school to learn about these different fields, to learn, you know, what seems to be like the best fit for what I want to do. Um, and I would say that would be my biggest piece of advice is learning about the different types of careers. And you can just do a Google search um, for, you know, jobs in mental health field. And then you'll see a lot of different things come up. But I think the biggest ones you'll see is um, a marital family therapist, a social worker, and LPCC, which is licensed professional licensed professional clinical counselor. And um, again, all three positions provide mental health. They may work in similar um, uh, types of agencies, um, but their work may be different. Their education is gonna be a little bit different. So, um, you know, think about that again, you know, there are many jobs just coming out with a bachelor's in psychology, but there's even more opportunities if you go on to a master's. And again, there's different master's programs depending on the direction you want to go to. You would get a master's in social work if you wanted to be a clinic, a licensed clinical social worker. There's programs where you would go in to be a licensed marital family therapist. And then there's um, pro graduate programs specifically for LPCC. And then there's specific graduate programs to be a school psychologist or a clinical psychologist. And then obviously you would go into um, medical school if you actually wanted to be um, a psychiatrist. So again, just educating yourself about the different kinds of fields. And I think that then will kind of ultimately carve out a path for you to take in college and then um, in the future post um, your bachelor's. So helpful. Thank you so much. And yes, I was trying to think of that teen line. Um, and I remember you talking about it once, but students, um, I, I am a school counselor, even though I don't directly serve students. I got my master's in school counseling and served as a counselor. It's also another great avenue. Uh, I knew I wanted to work in a K-12 system um, just based on experiences that I had in my life that either I didn't get the information in a timely manner, I was first generation college going, I saw with some of my other friends who had parents and grandparents and multi-generational going to college. And I just wanted to be a part of that process. Uh, when it comes to any of these programs, you can't go wrong, but what you should do. And um, the only thing that you should not do that I could recommend is 
not seek out information. No one is going to come to your door and knock and say, I'm going to tell you everything about social work and school counseling and these things. You have to be your own advocate. That means you have to ask for what you want. If you are at a puck school, you can go to any teacher, just like Dr. Saratoguda said, and say, I want to speak to a clinical counselor and ask them questions. They will help you. You don't know who to email. You go to any teacher and say that. They will help you get that appointment so you can ask them questions about their job. If you are at a Puck High School, you have Naviance. You go into Naviance, they have Road Trip Nation. They have Career Interest Inventories, Career Explorer, Self Strength Explorers. All of these individual assessments that take a little bit of your time, um, but once you get this information, it provides a tool for you and your counselor to help you find the right path. And again, um, I think someone, I, I forgot, sociology, who is a sociology major? Someone Me. Sociology, okay, Ms. Cavio was a sociology major. I was a psychology major and I believe Ms. Morales too. And Dr. Saratoguda, what was your major? So psychology? It was psychology. I also wanna, wanted to throw out there, not in a, a mental health field, but um, Ms. Amy Villasenor, what was your major? And tell, please explain what that is. Uh, yeah, um, I majored in anthropology, um, which is the study of humans at the most basic form, but there's a lot of different types of anthropology. There's um, biological, there's cultural, there's linguistic, um, there's archaeology, um, there's also forensic archaeology, and um, a lot of other branches of anthropology. And um, I find that if you really like working and understanding cultures, you want to do more um, just understanding people and understanding the systems and um, cultures that we create for ourselves, I find that is a great route to take, um, specific, especially if you're not entirely sure what you want to do afterwards. I think um, it's a really flexible major and it's not impacted hardly ever at any school. Um, usually psychology and sociology get real filled up, but anthropology is a great little segue into social sciences. If maybe you're not sure which avenue to take, maybe take one or two anthropology courses, declare that, and then go talk to those departments and maybe switch sides after you have a more solid plan if you're not quite sure. So that's a little sneaky route. Not everyone knows to take um, that I think is another good option. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. And, and like Ms. Morales said earlier, get, uh, and I, I forgot, one of you, maybe Ms. Cavillo said, I forgot now, but those intro classes, right? They're so valuable for your brain to know like, oh, this is what, this is how psychology is different than sociology than is different than anthropology. And sometimes just meeting the right instructor, the right professor lights you on fire and go, wait, I need to know more about this. This is a, this is a new something that I wasn't aware of that I'm interested in and might be my, my, my thing to pick for my career. But with that being said, Ms. Villasenor, did you get any um, questions yet? Um, no, we don't have any uh, student questions um, lined up. We're open if you'd like to type them in the chat, but I do have some questions prepared for our presenters um, just to get the juices flowing on our students' end as well. Thank you. Awesome. Okay, so I think first and foremost, um, you all handle a lot of really heavy topics, and I think we all know the kind of feeling of being tired after a long day of school and just wanting to chill out. Um, but you guys hand, work with a lot of people and handle a lot of really serious um, topics. So I'd love to know, um, how do you take care of your own mental health while managing topics such as these? Whoever wants to take it. Can you repeat the question? My computer cut out. Real sure. Quick. Um, how do you manage your own mental health? How do you take care of yourself while engaging a lot of these serious topics? I can answer it. Um, something for me that was really helpful, you know, starting off um, with working in intensive services, uh, which meant working with a lot of, you know, DCFS cases, MAC cases, um, 
for me, what was really helpful was also going to my own therapy, you know, and processing things that came up for me, like countertransference, which is when, you know, you're in a session and then say your client says something that reminds you of like your mom or your brother or whoever it might be, right? And and addressing that too, right? Because you have to be, as a therapist, you have to be really aware of yourself and what you're feeling and you have to be really present. So definitely practicing mindfulness, um, but for me, going to my own therapy was really helpful. And also just, you know, journaling for me was really helpful too. And just connecting with what was coming up for me in my sessions, just to be aware and even my supervision. Because starting off, you do have supervision with the supervisor. And you get to talk about your cases. You get to talk about, you know, if you're having difficulties or how can I approach this, right? And that's also a very helpful space to... Um, to like vet or to process with your supervisor as well um, but definitely using you know the resources that you have at work but even the people around you that the team that you work with too is also really helpful um, for me it was really helpful in talking with them great thank you um Ms. Calvillo um would you like to chime in sure um, so I'm also uh, in my own personal therapy to kind of, you know, when you're helping others with their, you know, issues, yours are definitely going to come up. Um, so I have my own therapy. I'm also part of a therapy group run by a professor at USC for um, social workers that are not yet licensed. So they're basically all new social workers and we all kind of process with each other what that experience is like. Um, you know, learning new skills, dealing with the financial aspects, kind of everything. Um, and then I also have personal supervision with both of my bosses. So in the ER, I have my supervisor, we meet weekly. And then my supervisor over at the rate treatment center, I'll get maybe like one or two cases a month. So if I get called in for a case, I'll meet with her uh, that week to kind of talk about it and process everything. That's awesome. Thank you for sharing. I think when students are considering um, jobs like these, it's usually a lot of the mentality of like, I want to help others. And it's really easy to start putting everyone else before yourself. And we kind of forget to take care of our own mental health. I, I think, I, I mean, uh, I don't know, I can't speak for your programs, but I know in school counseling, we're required to take counseling in, in our major to make sure that we're able to process and know our sticky points of when dealing with clients. Did your programs also require that you take counseling in them? I can, I can answer that. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, I would say that most graduate programs uh, that are focusing on mental health, like the LPCC, I think the social work program, as well, for, for sure, um, uh, marital and family therapy programs definitely require, well, they strongly encourage uh, students to uh, do their own personal mental health for a certain amount of hours. Um, I think that they they encourage you through you know extra credit in in school. I don't know if they can mandate it. Um, some programs might mandate it, but it makes the biggest difference in the world to be going through your own personal um, psychotherapy, especially when you're in graduate school and learning how to be a therapist. We're always talking about this with all of my trainees, um, how important self care is. I was really fortunate when I went through my master's program because it was focused on art. We learned so many different art um, techniques on how to kind of take care of ourselves that I think I just kept a lot of those self-care techniques that involved art um, and still practice them today, whether it's, you know, something like jewelry making or, you know, drawing in a journal, um, just constantly doing um, something uh, that is soothing, that is mindful, um, really helps a person to stay sane and be able to then focus their energies on um, the clients that they serve once they go into work when they've taken care of themselves. Great. Thank you so much. I think that's great for students to consider. Um, so I think this is a little bit more of a businessy question, um, but how important is networking and maintaining relationships in this field? whoever wants to take it. I, I can answer that question. Um, 
again, um, at the end of our traineeship, at the end of the year in May, um, I, like I said, I do a big job training um, workshop for all of my trainees. And one of the big things that we highlight is networking because you never know um, who might have an opening in their private practice. And, you know, there's a lot of things that people might not necessarily advertise um, that you can learn about by just to talking to people. I always say to my trainees, <clears throat> when you start looking for jobs, tell people that you're looking for a job because you never know, you could be getting your hair done and your hairdresser happens to be married to someone who's a therapist who you know, just recently found out that they're hiring at their agency. So you never know um, who might link, uh, link you up to someone else who might have something you're looking for. So I definitely think that networking via LinkedIn, um, going, well, I can speak for American Family Therapist. There's a, there's um, CAMFT, California Association of American Family Therapist. Um, there's AMFT, which is the American Association of American Family Therapist. Uh, if you go to these meetings, they're great ways to network. When people are looking to hire, they'll usually talk about it they'll post it there. Um, so just staying within your clinical community, knowing, you know, constantly talking to people. I have found that, you know, just word of mouth, someone will tell me about a great workshop or a great training um, that's being offered somewhere. So there's so much that even I myself as, you know, a licensed clinician in the field for many years, there's so many things I'm still learning just because I'm networking and interacting with other people in the field, not just married family therapists, but just other types of clinicians. Thank you. Um, Ms. Calvillo, is there anything else you wanna add? Um, yeah, I think definitely LinkedIn is a really, really great way to connect with people. Um, I think connecting with your therapist once you are in grad school, not your therapist, I'm sorry, your professors, because most of them have worked in the field and that's why they're now teaching. And they really know, I think most of the professors I had knew the top leadership and basically all of the little programs run in LA County. And when you're an intern, really, really maintain a good relationship with your supervisors. It's because of that, that I got hired straight out of school at UCLA. Um, because I made a good impression with the leadership there. And then both of my supervisors, you know, I had a great relationship with them. So they wrote my letters of recommendation. Um, so yeah, I think even if, you know, just don't burn bridges, there was a job opportunity that I was offered, didn't feel like a good fit, but my supervisor now was like, okay, you know, you never know who she knows or if you want to work there one day. So really make sure that you're really like kind and friendly about turning this down because the community is a lot smaller than you think. Uh, so being mindful of your interactions with other professionals. I, yeah. yeah, I would definitely agree with everything that has been shared already, you know, with networking and being part of different associations to help with networking too. Um, like for me right now, being in private practice, networking has been so helpful to get different referrals from people um and also just to let people learn about me too and so i think the networking is definitely something that's really important um in this field yeah thank you nicole i I just wanted to um, talk, you know, we're about to wrap up, but I just wanted to say thank you so much, uh, presenters, for sharing your story, for sharing your time. You had a long day of life and work and family and all of the things, and you still made time for Puck students. Um, the resources that you provided of the professional associations, of the teen line, if you complete that feedback survey, students or parents or guests, I will email you links to these associations and to these opportunities. So you, you don't have to uh, even look them up. It'll come right to your email box, your inbox. Um, you know, bottom line, there's tons of opportunities. People don't really volunteer for these opportunities to share about their careers unless they are passionate about what they do. So thank you for your work in helping uh, people with their mental health. Um, thank you for your time with our Puck School students. And um, students, if, if you have any last minute questions, feel free to speak up. Is, is there anything else anyone would like to share before moving or going on to whatever the rest of your day entails? 
I think quiet. one thing I want to men- mention is most of us, I think almost all of us presenters have master's degrees. And I know it could be, I know money is a big question for a lot of people. And I think just realize that there is a lot of help. There are a lot of grants, um, even with your master. So I don't think that you can't afford to go in. Always reach out to your counselors, both in high school, junior high, college. There's always a way to get these things done. It doesn't mean you have to get in massive debt either. So I think just listening to us, remember that we didn't all come from the same level when it comes to finances. There's a way for everybody to do it if you really want to. Thank you. Also, I like, I believe you shared, you went community college to four year. Ms. Morales yeah. and I, I believe uh, Christina, you both went into four years. So there's different paths. The whole thing is about the end game of getting the degrees, getting the certifications, the licensure, all of that. And, and there's not one way to get there. So, um, you know, I like Ms. Cavillo, you, you even talked about like, hey, you can go to one school and have it cost a, a lot of money or you might not be your dream school and go this other pathway and you come out debt free. Think about what you want and the end game again, getting that licensure, um, that master's degree, whatever you might need to serve the communities that you choose. Well, thank you all. It, it's it's a minute to, um, I'll stay on. And, and for students, if you have any other questions when you complete that survey, if you're looking for um, maybe something you wanted to ask that you didn't just wanna say, put it in the survey. There's a space for that and we'll follow up with you. Thank you for investing an hour of your time in your future and what you might want to do one day. Uh, it's important and we're glad to serve you through these combos. Thank you all presenters for being here. Greatly appreciate you. Thank you so much. Thanks for having us. Thank Absolutely. You. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Anyone on the call have any other questions? Yes, I, 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 this was Zoom was recorded. Um, we'll be able to share it. So if you just complete the, the, the link in the chat,